Okay, so last time um, I introduced the notion of freeness, which is the crucial concept in free probability theory. So let me just uh, recall this very briefly. Uh, so our setting is a non-commutative probability space, which consists of a unit algebra and a unit linear functional. Um, and then the notion of freeness concerns sub-algebras. So we have now a collection of sub-algebras, AI, which are indexed by some index at i, which can be final or infinite. And then we say those guys are free, or maybe we also say freely independent. To make this analogy to classical independence so somehow clear, which will be uh, the main philosophy understanding this notion of freeness. Okay, so we say this AI are free if the following happens. So, namely, if we are looking on a product of variables a1, a k, then phi, and this should be zero uh, under special conditions, namely. Whenever, okay, k is a natural number, uh, so we are multiplying one, two, three, or final number of elements. Those elements should, each of them should come from one of the sub algebras. Right? So let's say the j, uh, j term here, should belong to the sub algebra a i j. Uh, and so this i, i of j for each j is just one element in my index set. So i of j for all k securing here, uh, then we also assume that each of those guys, each of these factors, we said that phi of aj should be equal to zero for all j from one to k. And then in addition, we also want that neighboring factors here are coming from different uh, subalgebras. So this means that a1, which comes from the algebra. Uh, AI1 comes from a different algebra than the second, and the second guy is the algebra A of I2, so I1 should be different uh, from I2, and so on up to the last one. Oh, okay, so this always means that uh, neighbors are different. Huh? So I1 could be the same as I3, huh? that, that's no problem. The only neighboring element should come from different algebras. Uh, okay, so that's the definition of freeness. Also, it's a definition for subalgebras in a big algebra with respect to a linear function of phi. Uh, and we saw last time that this, at least there is one canonical example where we have a situation like this. Uh, the definition looks a bit strange if you see it for the first time, so it might not be clear whether there is any situation where you have, can have anything like this. But actually, uh, if you go to a free group algebra or group, and then you have subgroups which are free in algebraic sense. Then, if you consider the corresponding group algebras, then this translates uh, into this freeness with respect to a canonical linear functional which corresponds to the uh, mutual element in the group. Good. Okay. And then, well, of course, also we know this at least is something which appears somewhere. Uh, but of course, it's absolutely not clear what this definition really tells us. Huh? What, what, is, what is the meaning of this? And the first step in this direction was a proposition from last time, which showed us that actually what this here is somehow telling us, uh, it allows us to calculate uh, the expectation applied uh, yeah, to products coming from the various subalgebras uh, if we know the value of the phi on the subalgebras. Oh, okay. So this definition determines the value of phi uh, on any element, uh, let, let's say A. A is, is the algebra which is generated by the AIs. Oh, okay, so, uh, and then phi on A is determined by knowledge of phi restricted to each of the AIs and this freeness condition. Uh, that's what we saw last time, uh, but the proof was somehow uh, yeah, not really explicit. It gave us an algorithm for calculating the, it, but uh, it didn't give us a direct and explicit formula. Huh? And so maybe we should uh, try to see some examples to really uh, understand how this works. Okay, okay so let us do some examples. Uh, and for this, so let's consider two sub algebras which are free. Let's say I1 and I2. 
2 and they are free uh, in our mobility space A5 uh, and now yeah so I'm looking on somehow products of elements coming from the different algebras and of course the simplest product is, is of, of, of form AB where A comes from the first algebra and B from the second algebra so what does this definition tell us about something like this? in principle we know uh, phi of this guy must be determined somehow but how is this completely? so we consider let's say element from the first algebra and element from the second algebra then we ask what is phi of AB? Oh, okay. The definition of course tells us phi of AB if in addition uh, we also know that phi of A is 0 and phi of B is equal to 0. But in general of course this will not be the case. So how do we address the uh, general situation? And the idea of the proof from last time was <coughs> that we should go over to center variables. Huh? So I mean, we, somehow we must relate things to the situation which we have the definition where all our variables are centered. Okay, that's what we're doing here. So namely, I mean phi of AB, we don't know directly what this is, but what we know is the situation if we replace our variables by the center pairs. So if I consider A minus phi of A times 1, and of course phi of this is 0, and I multiply this with the same thing in B, so then B minus phi of B times 1. Right, so phi of this is 0. And of course, I mean, this is an element in the unity algebra generated by this A, which is A1. So this is in the algebra A1. This is in the algebra A2. So here I have alternating the elements from my two algebras. Uh, and in addition, now I also have the phi of this is 0, phi of this is 0. So now I'm in the situation of the definition of freeness, and the definition of freeness tells me this is equal to 0. Good. But on the other hand, of course, I can also multiply this out. And then, of course, I get the term AB, no? the one in which I'm interested. So I get here, it's phi AB. Then I have uh, this term, so this is uh, minus phi. Phi of B is just a number, this comes out. And then I have here A times 1, so I have phi of A times 1. Of course, this is just phi of A. Then I have this term and this term, where I have minus uh, this phi of a, this number comes out of the phi, and then I have phi of 1 times b, which is of course just uh, phi of b, and then I have this times this, so I have minus times minus, which is plus phi of a and phi of b, I just have these numbers, which are coming out of my phi, and then I have 1 times 1, so I have phi of 1 times 1, which is phi of 1. Oh, okay. But now you, just, you see, we always have phi of 1 is equal to 1, which of course we also used here. Also, this is just 1. And we have here phi of a times phi of b. And here we have the same, here we have the same. So we have this term phi of a times phi of b uh, three times, once with a plus, twice with a minus. So what we have in the end is just uh, phi of a b minus phi of a times phi of b. So we see that we have 0 is equal to this which just means that phi of a times b is the same as phi of a times phi of b. So this implies phi of a times b is phi of a times phi of b. Okay, huh? so this is somehow this algorithm which we had last time in action. Huh? So we just, instead of looking on the product in which you're interested, we look on the corresponding product of centered variables, then at least we know that we get 0, and then hopefully, I mean, we multiply out everything and we get uh, the, leading, uh, the value of the leading order, or the product which we're interested in terms of smaller order terms which we can deal with. Now, in principle, you can do this for any product. Okay. So, namely, maybe more complicated one. So, consider now, let's say, two elements. First algebra, uh, B, B1, B3, and second. So the A's are in B1, the B's are in the second. Then, uh, 
uh, what is the next complicated thing? Let's say this is A, B, A. Huh? Huh? So here we might imply A plus B. Then the next thing is A, B, E. A, B, A. Well, in general, A1, B, A2. And again, we don't know directly what this is, but we know what it is if we set the variables. So this means uh, we know if we are looking on the product, A1 minus 5, A1 times 1 times B minus 5, B times 1 times 2 times 5, times 1, then this is equal to 0. Huh? So 5 of this is 0, because I just sent the guy. This is 5 of this is 0, 5 of this is 0. This comes from A1, this comes from A2, and this comes from A1. Huh? So neighbors are coming from different algebras. And then the definition of element, Freeness tells me that 5 is equal to 0. But again, I can multiply it out. I get 5 of A1 times B times A2. And I get other other terms, which I can calculate. In particular, because I already know something like this. Huh? OK, and so this here implies, if you work this out, that 5 a1, b, a2 is equal. Again, I just have a factorization of two terms, namely 5 of a1 times a2 times 5 of b. Oh, okay, and working this out is sort of the sign this which you have to do. And in particular, I'll make the next, the next term, which is maybe, maybe more interesting. And maybe now let me take the product of four guys. A, B, A, B, that alternatively, and maybe A1, B1, A2, B2, in general. And again, uh, to connect with this definition of freeness, I look at the product of the standard variables, also A1 minus 5. A1 times 1, the same as B1. Formula, but when you start the calculation, probably you have no idea what to get here. No? 
why three terms? And I mean, what, what are the signs here? Maybe if, if you have uh, more terms, you might also get uh, some integers there. And so this means, I mean, in principle, we know that everything is determined. We have an algorithm for determining it. But the structure of the result, the structure of the formula, at the moment is not clear. And I mean, it will be one of the tasks that we have to understand this structure better. Okay, so maybe. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is getting uh, more complicated, and I mean, we will come back to this soon. But maybe let me also point out that maybe those formulas now give. Are very similar to formulas which we have in probability theory for independent random variables. And this is, of course, the idea that what we are doing here is a kind of, 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 of non commutative uh, uh, independence. Okay, so I use those formulas here. We will consider them uh, as analogs of uh, formulas from. Classical probability theory for the calculation of the joint moments of independent random variables. Consider those formulas uh, as a kind of non commutative analog of uh, formulas. Set omega. 
Okay, so this gives us an algebra, and then what is phi? Phi is of course also the canonical thing which you do, uh, what you do in classical probability theory with random variables, and then you average them. No? And averaging or integrating with respect to your measure is a linear function. So Phi, which you can see that here, corresponds to the expectation, or taking the expectation, from classical, in such a classical setting. So this means phi of x, so x is now a random variable, measuring the function of my set, so this is the same as the expectation of x, which is just given by integrating my function, so x, Omega with respect to my probability measure over the space formula. Oh. Oh, so this is a linear, this is a uh, linear function, eh? and of course it's also unit eh? oh. so, uh, non-commutative probability space setting. We always want uh, a unit linear functionals, and of course phi of one there is one, and this is really the fact that p of the whole space is equal to 1. No? Because if I integrate the constant function 1 over the whole space, I get just p of omega. No? And for a probability measure, p of omega is 1. No? p is a probability, so p of everything is 1. No? So, so this, this unitality of the phi, this really corresponds somehow uh, to the fact that we are really dealing with probability measures, not just any measure, really probability measure. Good. Okay, so this means that also a classical probability space can be seen as a non-commutative probability space. So non-commutative just means it's a general probability space. Commutative is seen allowed. Uh, can, can be seen as this. Uh, of course, we are losing somehow the underlying space omega. Huh? We don't see events anymore. Huh? We just, in our setting, we are just talking about the random variables and we can just average over them. We don't see see events. Okay, that's the price we can see in our algebraic setting. Good, and so if you have the classical probability space, then of course there the crucial notion uh, is the notion of independence. Oh, okay, so what does it mean that the random variables are independent? Again, just a factorization of mixed moments. Into the expectation of x to the n 
n times the application of y to the n. Down the mode of course of classical random variables commute. So this is really all information which I need about classical random variables. Okay, good, but in such a classical setting, of course, there's you there's there's more structure. No? I mean it's, it's not just this algebraic uh, setting that I have a, an algebra in the unit of linear functional, but there is, of course, some positivity behind. Huh? I mean, the probability measure, measure has some positivity. Huh? So I have, in particular, I have the notion of positivity. Huh? I have a star structure. I mean, the functions are going to C. So I also have a complex conjugate of function. And I have a positivity. So then, if I integrate a positive function, of course, the result is positive. And I also have some faithfulness. And if I <coughs> integrate a positive function, I get zero. Then the function itself is zero. And so this means there is more analytic structure there. And usually, in our non commutative setting, uh, we also have additional structure. Huh? So usually our algebra is not just an algebra. Phi is not just a linear guy. But very often we have more structure. And we have some positivity. So A is a star algebra, and phi is also positive. Huh? OK, and the notion of freeness also goes well with all those additional structures. Oh, okay, so I mean, we will come back to this later. Oh, so, so the core of free probability can be uh, investigated on a purely algebraic level, uh, but usually in concrete applications, we really have additional uh, structure around. And maybe let me put this here as a definition of possible additional structures uh, which we have. So now we are back to general. Probability space setting, so the phi should be a uh, space. And then there's one uh, interesting situation uh, which one has very often named that phi is a trace. Uh, so phi has a kind of, of commutativity, so namely phi is a trace. Uh, this means following that uh, the algebra elements commute under phi. So when phi of a b is the same as phi of b a uh, for all a and b in my algebra a. Uh, this problem is called the trace. For example, the usual trace of matrices has this property. That's the usual property of it. And also, in, in very, very often, in the Riemann algebra setting, we have uh, linear functions which are trace. Uh, so if, if phi has this property, then we call our non commutative probability space uh, tradition. state and if I have all this structure then we go 
call uh, our non-commutative probability space a star probability space. And then it five. This means if I have a star, then I also want my phi to be positive. No? Otherwise, the star doesn't really work. Well. Okay, and then in this setting, we can also talk about uh, faithfulness. No? So this is like saying that if I want, if I integrate a positive function, then I want to get a positive integral. Okay, but in this setting, usually I have more. Maybe if I integrate. Uh, positive function I get zero, then the function itself should be zero. That is the notion of faithfulness, which we can also state in this setting. Uh, so the star probability setting to state phi is called faithful if we have that we now I have the element A in my algebra and phi of a star a is equal to zero, or I'm integrating this positive element, then this positive element better should be zero, which actually should be that a is zero. Then I require that a is equal to zero. Yeah, that's my definition of faithful. And very often, the states which I consider are faithful. So this means essentially they contain a lot of information about the algebra. And that's what would be usually. Okay, in particular, in the group algebra case, which we considered last time, I mean, last time I, I, I defined the group algebra only as an algebra, but of course we can put the star structure on this, uh, where the star comes from the inverse in the group, and then it turns out that I mean the this functional, which we have, actually is positive and faithful. No? And that's also something that you should prove in the science. No? So this is that usually, in our examples, we, we have such nice states. Good. So if I have now those notions, so maybe now we can also go further and do some probabilistic language for our moments so of elements which we are interested in, in the general non commutative probability space, we will use a language which is analog to the classical language. So let me make some more definition. <coughs> so usually we are interested in elements in our algebra and we call them random uh, variables. Huh? Non commutative random variables, but usually are. Don't have it out, you're not commutative. So elements in A are called maybe non-commutative, usually I with it's adjective, friend variables. So elements in our algebra are what we call random variables, and our interest is, is in random variables. So elements in algebra. And the information which you usually use about them are their moments. So what are the moments? The moments of a random variable, let's say only one. Uh, the random variable is an element of algebra, so let's say A. So those are just, I mean, phi applied to powers of those are numbers phi applied to a to the a is a natural number. Okay, so if I have one random variable, then the main information which I have about this element is just phi applied to power. If I have several random variables, uh, then of course I look for their joint moments. And this just means phi like any product in them. So if I have not just one, but more random variables, then we have to look at the moments.
random variables, let's say S and E, so A1 up to S, and random variables are just elements in A. So what are their joint moments? Those are the numbers uh, phi applied to any product of those A's, so in any order and uh, if anything this is. So this means this is A of Algebra. 
der endlich mal auch ein Schiff ist, somehow to render So, jetzt ist der Finition. Okay, and of 
because we already have seen a few examples of this. Oh, so For example, let's say I consider now two random variables, A and B. If let's say A and B are free, then we have seen that if I want to calculate phi of A to the N times B to the M, this factorizes as phi of A N B to the N. This was this rule that phi of, uh, of AB uh, is equal to phi of A times phi of B if A and B are coming from, uh, from free uh, subject class. And of course, I mean uh, A and A to the N are coming from free subject class in this case. Uh, okay, so this is one rule. And the other rule which we have is maybe for product of this form, AB, AB. This calculates as phi of a squared of b squared plus a squared of b squared minus a squared phi of b squared. Well, this was the rule of phi of a1, b1, a1, b2 uh, calculates like this. Oh, okay. So it calculates like this in the case <coughs> Okay, and of course, I mean, this first rule, this is very simple, and this is actually the same rule as we have for independent random variables. But the second rule, of course, this is, this is the, the strange thing, which we still have uh, to understand, understand, and actually, I mean, this, this rule is very different from the rule which we have for, for commuting. You maybe missed some targets in the first rule, it's a trivial. Ah, uh, yeah, it's trivial. Yeah. Here, this rule, uh, this is very, very different. Huh? Okay, and actually, this rule doesn't fit this commutativity. Huh? I mean, if, if A and B are passive random variables and they are independent, then of course A, B, A, B is the same as A squared, B squared, and then this factorizes like 5 of A squared times 5 of B squared, and this is very different from what we have here. Huh? Okay. So this, this <coughs> shows that Freeness and independence are somehow classical. Let's say free independence and classical independence are somehow of a similar nature, but it's not that one includes the other. Of course, the rules in simple cases are the same, but in general uh, they are very different. And in particular, it turns out that freeness and commutativity are not compatible. Oh, okay, so I mean, uh, commuting variables can be free only in very trivial situations. Huh? So maybe we should uh, really uh, state this <coughs> as a precise proposition because it really shows that freeness is something that you don't see in classical mobility theory. I mean, I mean, you could think that maybe freeness is a rule for factorization, maybe this is a rule which also makes sense for, for commuting variables, and then it would be a special kind of dependence between the classical random variables, but that's not the case. Huh? I mean, for classical random variables, you almost never see freeness, only in very uh, trivial situations. And so let us uh, move this. Also, so freeness is really a, a genuine non commutative uh, concept. Also, it's parallel. The classical independence, but it's a parallel which you only see in the non commutative world. <coughs> Of course, that's something, uh, if you want to make statements like this, you should have that your phi 
is, is faithful, so that really, it really gives you properties uh, fragile. So, I actually assume that this is a, this is a star mobility space. Then I can talk about faithfulness, and I assume that phi is faithful. Okay, now consider two random variables, and let me also assume that they are self adjoint. One self adjoint variable, so x is equal to x star. No? So this corresponds in the classical setting, I mean, I said a random variable is a, is a measurable function which goes to complex numbers. A self adjoint random variable, of course, is one which goes to real numbers. Maybe that's just what you usually call a random variable. Usually, you consider know, real random variable. Okay, so let's say I have one such variable, which is server joint, and another one, y, also, <coughs> server joint, random variable, and then assume, and assume that those two guys are free, but that they also commute. Well, this would be something which I would have if I have classical random variables which are free. Free, but they are always common. Okay, and then I'm claiming that such a situation must be a trivial situation, which means that x or y, at least one of them, is just a multiple of the identity. Okay, so, so there are trivial situations where you have freeness, namely multiples of the identity, but that's the only thing I want you to claim this. Zero. 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 Zero.
after all, is equal. So I bring this on the other side, so I have here a pi of x squared times pi y squared plus this term plus x squared and y squared. And then I have the two cross terms, one square inside, one square outside. On the other side is minus sign. Minus x squared. Now the product, no, this can be used as a product of uh, something in x and something in y. So namely this is the same as pi of x squared uh, minus pi of x squared minus pi of y squared minus pi of y squared. Oh, oh. So if I multiply this, I get this term and this term and the two cross terms. So I have a product of two terms which is equal to zero, which means that at least one of them is equal to zero. So let's say the term in the x is equal to zero. And then of course, I mean, what we have here is, is of course the, the variance of x is equal to zero, but this means x has to be a constant. So let us see this formula. Actually, the only possibility 
Uh, in the classical world, or if guys are from you, uh, they can have uh, freeness is for constant functions. Okay, but this is this is true. I mean, constant functions or multiples of one are really free from everything. No? That's like for classical random variables. Constant uh, random variables are independent from everything. Uh, not just among yourself, but from everything, and that's also the same in, in, in for freeness. So let us also formulate this. Position. Uh, so this says that one, or multiples of one, are free from everything. The one one commutes with fits into this frame here, from you, and but if it is free, it can only be a constant, but actually for constant, this is really true. So, let's see now, you will find I want the mobility space, and then I'm claiming that constants one, uh, are free from everything. Precisely, uh, freeness, let's say, is between subalgebras. So, what the, the, the subalgebra for 1 is just c times 1, and then if I take any other subalgebra of my A, then I have freeness. So, this means uh, for any unit subalgebra E in this algebra A, we have that this V and the subalgebra generated by 1, which is just C times 1, that those guys are free. So the subalgebra B, we have that V and C times 1, which of 1, are free. So this is the subalgebra. Okay, so let's prove this. I think this is a very simple proof. Just going back uh, to the definition of freeness and just to check what it means there. And it follows very easily. Two. But in this case, as I said before, at least one of those guys must come 
uh, from sub algebra C times 1. So then at least one, I mean general more, times enough for our arguments, so let's say AJ comes from C times 1. Okay, but we also require that those guys are centered. So we also know that phi in j is equal to 0. But aj coming from c times 1 means it's a multiple of 1, and so of course phi of this guy is just uh, this multiple, this factor. But if this factor uh, is equal to 0, this means this aj, AJ must, must be 0. Not only. For elements from here, phi of aj equal to 0 means that the guy itself is equal to 0. So this means uh, aj is equal to 0. And then, of course, now it's, it's clear, I multiply now here my element, and one of the factors is equal to 0, then the whole thing is 0. And one of aj is equal to 0. And then, of course, if I apply phi, is equal to zero. Huh? Okay, so this is really true, huh? because in this case, uh, the elements from here, this condition on phi is the same as the algebraic condition that is equal to zero. And then, of course, it goes over to the program immediately. Good. So this shows us that uh, ones are free from everything. But in the commutative world, multiples of ones are really the only thing which can be free. Yeah. And so maybe the conclusion which we draw from all this, what we have done, so this is the end of uh, chapter one, is that yeah, what we are doing here is actually a kind of uh, has a stochastic flavor. Huh? We are dealing with objects which are more random variables and we are dealing with them in a way as, as we are dealing with classical uh, random variables. But of course the difference is that our random variables uh, usually don't compute. So, so, and that's why we are saying that we are doing here a kind of non-commutative probability theory. So maybe that's the of this chapter. Calculations are getting very tough and 
complex if the moment is really getting uh, much longer. Uh, so what we really need is a more conceptual insight into the structure of those formulas. Uh, and that's what we want uh, to do in the next chapter. And yeah, I think I stop here for today. Next chapter will be next time. Okay. Thank you.